good afternoon this reminds me of the beginning of my career as a lecturer in psychiatry for undergraduates the reason is the lecture of first mbbs in psychology and for second mbbs third term or third mbbs first term in psychiatry was always at 2 pm post lunch and as you know all of you that the subject psychiatry i don't know today but then didn't carry any marks in examination so it was one of the most difficult subject to address and attract students sitting here so i'm very thankful for giving me a reminder of my early career as a teacher and second thing which is important i'm very happy to be here is because soon after my md in 1978 the first place i visited for two weeks was pgi mer when i met savita and other many of the stalwarts who are here today to see what pgi mer was and i can't forget the warm hospitality offered to me not only by the department but dr n n wig and from that time onwards till he passed away we have been in close contact even to the extent when i was director of film institute he came and spent one week at the guest house of the film institute and we interchanged a lot of things so i'm very happy to be back here again after so many years and also tomorrow attend the oration for dr big <clears throat> what inspired my title of presentation is actually theme of your conference mental health of the people by the people and for the people and that's what inspires me to say reorienting towards mental health i am deeply indebted to my seniors my colleagues my associates my students and above all all my patients who have both knowingly or unknowingly enriched my diverse experiences in mental health profession and also to all my friends in theater and films who helped me to understand mind much better than the textbooks my observations essentially spring from the living waters of my psychiatric practice as also multitude of theater and film experiences spanning over last four decades so let me start with a little story because i'm going to talk about emotions and i find it very paradoxical that educated academicians speak about emotions in cognitive terms and why it is so it has come and i have a little story to share with you which uh, what happened exactly and this occurred to me much more in this century when we came into digital communication because earlier before the print media took over education both education information and entertainment the medium for everyone was oral medium maukhik parampara thi in which we shared everything and that was very good the reason is first of all the spoken word doesn't have to be grammatically correct every time unless you are a great orator but for communication you can do it even in monosyllables because in oral tradition word never came alone word came with a full family word came with an image and word came with a voice one of the reasons why i'm not showing any slide or any screen 
is because essentially what happened in this story. So when all of them were together and a very wise, cognitively intelligent man, as you all know, the cognitive brain developed much later, much later, and only then this oral tradition was taken over by a written tradition. So this wise man who found out the technology of writing, I call it technology, because not inherent, because he prepared alphabet from image and sound. And that is why we have many languages because they differ from place to place. So anyway, so he developed this concept of a written language. And initially it was okay because it was manuscript, only one copy. But in advancement of technology, when printing technology came, then multiple copies were available and like God went to houses, even the knowledge went to houses and you didn't have to go to Gurukul or anything. But what happened in the process? When print media took over the oral media, it dominated also all three spheres. What we read for entertainment is different from what we read for information and what we read for education. But in the process, what happened, this written world lost its parents, that is image and voice. So in a way, word became an orphan. But this wise, cognitively intelligent man knew what to do with this orphan. So he reassured him, said, don't worry. I will have a nice orphanage for you. And he built a beautiful orphanage and kept all the words in that orphanage. And this orphanage was called book. So all the words finally found safety, security, and everything in book. And since it was an orphanage, there was a discipline. Written word had to follow certain rules like we all have to in orphanage. And these rules were called the grammar. So written language has grammar. And if you don't observe that grammar, then what you talk is called irrelevant, incoherent, and it's immediately in the field of mental illness and not wise. Anyway, so this orphanage hosted this orphan word, which kept on wondering, What's my voice like? What do I look like? And many, many, many years ago, this wise man showed him a radio and said, this is where your voice, where he heard voice first. And then just about 150 years ago or so, that wise man showed him his mother on the screen. That's your image. Ah, he was very happy. Ultimately, I found my mom and dad. But unfortunately, the word was in the book. Father was in the sky. And the mother was on the screen. It's only now in digital communication. Thanks. Even to the advancement by Mr. Modi. Everybody has found, all these three people have found a nice, affordable, accessible home where all of them, the whole family has come together. And that's mobile before that computer. Do you agree? If you differ in this, we can start arguing right here. But I think it's only in digital era that again, all three of them have come together. But the problem, where the problem begins? Problem begins is all these years, this cognitively highly developed man 
had completely taken over charge of education. And so in formal education, what became mandatory and compulsory is to learn reading and writing. And in India, not only one language, three languages. The region where you belong to, the regional language, Hindi as a national language, and English as a business language, which communicates all through the India. That became mandatory to learn reading and writing and irrespective of our professions, whether we become a chef or a doctor or an engineer or an architect, there is no excuse. And you have to learn for minimum 15 years reading and writing of a written language. So our education, formal education, is completely dominated by this cognitively developed phenomena. In the process, what happened? <coughs> All we learn and learning became associated with the word called textbook. All the subjects which we learn for exam and curricular subjects, all curricular subjects have textbook which is in complete paradox to life. I'll tell you how and why, and how it leads to mental health. Tell me, since all of you are academically very bright, any one of you here would claim that particularly a medical theory book, anybody has been able to finish in a day? Please raise hand. For those intelligent people who have been competent enough to read a full textbook in one day, either in English, Marathi or whatever. Now I have other question. Haven't you read a 1000 page novel in one day? Now have you ever thought why? Reason is very simple. Textbook is without any subtext and the life is full of subtext and that subtext is emotion, if you agree. Now that leads me to my presentation, matter of life and death. Vital functions of respiration and circulation establish not only beginning of life, but cessation of those functions to establish end of life. So our entire concept of beginning and end of life depends on these two functions. So when you acquire these two functions, you are registered as born. And when you lose these two functions, either slowly or altogether, you can be registered as dead. Why this is important? And these two are called vital functions. Now this is very surprising for me that what is the process of birth and health before we come? For me, process of birth is one mass of matter comes out of another mass of matter. Which is tangibly what we see. What we see is actually a one mass of matter growing and suddenly one day it throws out from itself another mass of matter. But that mass of matter is not designated as a being. Why? Because that mass of matter hasn't started functioning. And everybody keenly waits for that mass of matter to function. And that first function it does, which generally referred to as a birth cry, medically is first respiration. Agree? 
then that's the only moment when everybody around is smiling and you appear like crying but even then you don't have full independent existence only if you sustain that function then the cord is cut making sure that your heart pumps on its own and you acquire your second vital function that is risk circulation so as you know now the concept of life itself is not structure is functional that independent mass of matter when makes two functions and that is why they are termed as vital functions right then you are designated as being and when you end these two functions that mass of matter whether immediately after coming out or 100 years after is disposed of so to me what is body body is an instrument or a temporary residence of mind and then what is mind which was the posing question for me when i taught undergraduate something intangible how do you convince them of the existence of mind what came to my head and which appealed to them at least if not convince them confuse them i asked them what is the relationship between the instrument and music if you understand the relationship between the instrument and music you understand the relationship between body and mind by cutting the instrument you are not going to find music can we find music by cutting the instrument no by tuning the instrument you are able to produce music Now, if you are able to produce music, then we also need to tune our body to play this mental music. So, when the concept of mental health comes, it depends upon tuning your body, and that's the only importance of so-called physical health. So, first of all, for me, physical health and mental health. are not two separate entities at all if at all it is a single entity it is mental health is the concept body is the instrument for that now in the advance of technology gradually till today technological advances have made tremendous difference to our concept of health life and death so respiration and circulation establish existence but do they define life without third vital function and i'm sure at least all of you will agree though many of the biological other doctors not psychiatrists may not agree third vital function is emotion which is present right at birth but like conscious mind and unconscious mind it is subconscious and unconscious <coughs> <coughs> but it's very important to recognize that function as a vital function because cessation of emotional experience designates your life as a vegetative existence do you agree and earlier when the concept of medicine didn't develop because you could not dispose of the body which is still having two vital functions third vital function was not taken into consider and all such people were dumped into isolation 
called mental hospital. That's the beginning actually of, and it's actually concept of mental health spread from people like Clifford Beers or Gayatri Ramdas or many such people who have come out and proved to the world that like physical illness from mental illness also we can be purely functional and back to normal. That is very important to know is concept of mental health. So as I already told you, music doesn't reside in the instrument. So is mental health merely a set of serum values, ECGs, EEGs, and nuclear imaging reports? Today, this question becomes very pertinent and valid because the major complaint from our clients or patients, whatever, doctors have no time to see us. And even if we sit in front of them, they see the reports, but don't see us. We even refrain from touching the patient. And if you remember the beginning of our medical education, at least in my time, it started with clinical skills, which were all based on sensory systems. That is agreed. Inspection, palpation, percussion, auscultation. Now I take a pause here only to tell you why. Because <clears throat> human being is probably the only animal which takes so long to develop. At birth, we are the laziest and dumbest people. It takes even 16, 17 years for us to physically develop. Then we try to develop so-called mentally or psychologically. And if we succeed in both and realize the non-meaningless of both the existence without the third spiritual one, but I'm not going to go there still because I don't want me to be termed as a Baba anymore, right? But it is very important to know that at birth, what is important? For first six years, which we call medically as formative years of life. And why we were not sent to school or Gurukul till we were six years old. We are sent into this world with five antennas. I'll give you an equivalent concept. I did a film, Kaso, called Turtle, where we had to study the olive ridley turtles. And the speciality of those is the female olive ridley turtles come to the shore only to lay eggs. And after laying eggs, they go straight to the sea. And when the eggs burst and the new turtles come, they walk and also go into the sea. So actually, no mother knows which is their child. So there is a myth that why the eyes of the olive ridley turtle are moist. Because every time olive ridley mom sees a baby turtle, she thinks it may be mine. Now what scientists had done, once they caught this olive ridley mother after laying the eggs when she was going back, scientists caught hold of her, put antennas on her back and let her go into the deep sea. And that's how they collected information of the deep sea life through those antennas. Same is true with us. We are left into this world, dropped into this world in the form of this new entity, new mass of matter with five antennas. And these, we have a better term in Indian languages called Jnanendriyas, not sensory 
Nanendriyas. Because we collect all the information about the world and these are experiences which are very, very important. And these antennas are developing and maturing for first five years. So if you see, parents as well as attending doctors are very pertinent to see whether the growth of these sensory organs is adequate or not. So all these turning, when well, you all know, so I may not say that, it becomes very mandatory to see whether all the senses are in its place before the cognitive brain starts developing. So intelligence and cognitive brain development comes, it is in rudimentary form there, no doubt. But what develops first are the sensory apparatus which are going to feed the cognitive brain and cognitive brain is nothing but CPU. It's a central processing unit of all this information which is received. And only in psychiatry we have this term that says perception is the meaningful interpretation of senses and which is immediate. It's only after the development of the cognitive brain we have two types of reactions. One is immediate, one is delayed. One is based on perception and emotional experience and the other is developed by thought process, thinking of those perceptions and everything, which is very important. So that poses some questions for me. Is life like birth and death only a medical certificate? Is human health functional or structural? A mere quarantine of disorder does not mean mental health. Patient's mental makeup resulting from his socioeconomic and cultural situation needs to be considered in the thinking of mental health. May not be mental illness, but mental health definitely because it takes into cognizance the emotional experience. Another break I take to explain that why I feel this is very important to know. This long spell of cognitive dominance, which I term today as almost cognitive terrorism, have clubbed all sensory skills and everything in one umbrella term called extracurricular activities. And it's not given any official recognition till you really establish your skill in it. I'm sure while I was being introduced also in many places today, I'm invited not only because I'm a psychiatrist, but only also because of what I have done in so-called extracurricular activities. And I think my extracurricular activities have complemented my curricular. And that is why I think I got the information from textbook, but I understood the meaning of that information from experiences of life. And Experiencing is a very different term than knowing. This another point of significance, I would try, you know it all, I'm just trying to bring it to your notice. Earlier, before this cognition took over, or even after cognition took over, but the information sources were very limited. There was no information source except your parents in the family nearby. And as you grow, then you appear, your relatives, then you go to 
gurukul or school and your, your teachers. So by the time you develop proficiency in reading and writing and drawing meaning out of it, you are already 16, 17 years old and had a lot of experience of life. So earlier, whenever we received information, we already had experience of life. And we weighed the information on the basis of our experience. Today, it is completely reversed. We have too much information, not only information, too much information before we have any experience of life. So now we are at a risk of judging our experiences on the basis of information. And in fact, you have information about all emotional experiences. So today, majority of you, I don't know, think emotions rather than feel emotions. And I know this very well. Feeling emotion is very important, as important or probably more by thinking emotions. Think about and this I learned when I was being trained as an actor. Because when I was given all the paraphernalia, like makeup and costume and everything, and I was asked to act as a 65 year old, and my director was not happy, he would utter only one sentence. Mohan, take the feel of the character. Now that is something. Something intangible and something very important. So, in our consideration of mental health, <coughs> we need to have some holistic approach. Means, at different points of development, we should think it differently. So, it is dependent on age, whether we are infant, we are still growing. Then, after growing, what are our ambitions? What is our purpose of life as we have found out? Level of function, capacity to work under stress and performance, volition. Are we willing to live or we have no volition? This particularly became very important for me, especially when I first time saw that in Canada, a child with cerebral palsy and west downwards Paralytic, walked for one mile to do fundraising. And in my ward, I saw a patient with two fine legs, but with no will to walk. And I realized the difference between health and illness. I think that is why the concept of health also should be functional. And because concept of health is not static, it's a dynamic concept. At no point of time, we can claim to be healthy or unhealthy because it's constantly up and down as we live. And that becomes very important for me. So the volition and degree and quality of life is as important as just living. Social status, recluse, well-placed, or revert. And later in life, particularly dependent and self sustaining. So, coming towards almost the end of what mental health to public health means to me is like William Osler said medicine is an art based on science, not simply a science but also not merely an art. Considering emotional and cognitive experiences does not negate the role and significance of modern medicine. Modern medical breakthroughs are indisputable, invaluable to mankind. It's only their application that merits a sensitive and a holistic approach. Let the purist fight with the non-conformist or the credence and relevance 
a bio a biopsychosocial model we should do well to prescribe holistic solutions to our patients not mechanical procedures and orgies modern medicine should be guided by the patient's inherent will to live not his humdrum survival an elderly cerebral palsy patient delighted with every extra step he takes the volition justifies every effort aimed at his survival and well-being a bedridden patient devoid of will hope and time coping with the terminal illness the actual cost of cure needs to be dispassionately measured in the light of socio economic circumstances even at the cost of right sizing the patient as well as relatives expectation i think this is a very important point which is in the domain of thinking and not only emotion quality of life is subjective the concept includes life itself freedom from symptoms capacity to perceive valued activities and affordability the larger cause for me the medical profession owes its essence and credence to patients alone that is primary hospitals and clinics should not be reduced to insurance companies profiting from the fear of death and disease sorry to say this very bluntly but just before the pandemic i was i had inner compulsion to do a play all thoda samajh lo patient ko ya doctor ko and to make comments about the corporatization of everything and the three pillars of health in which patient is one doctor is another and third is nature so even if doctor does everything right patient does everything right outcome is not guaranteed and even if patient does something stupid and doctor makes a mistake patient survives these miracles and anybody who doesn't believe in miracle is not a realist this is very important lesson i have learned in life so what is important is to make genuine effort and that trust relationship which we have lost between us and our patient patients and doctors have become more like prosecutors and defendants and this is a really subject of great worry to me medical science must direct its effort and advancemental towards patient's well-being and not just give him extension of life i think that's very important i will end with dr negi's quote <clears throat> which i had found and is gone but i will find out very soon dr neki said once human experience is essentially intangible trying to make that tangible measurable quantifiable and then reduce to p negative values is reductionist approach to health thank you very much very good i'll be happy to take any question probably today is the first talk of mine where i have not shown any film okay. thank you thank you normally sir. i don't go anywhere either i show one minute film five minute film full featured film is like a short story to an epic novel because i firmly believe that learning not only through book is important but learning through lens and drum 
is as important as learning through play. And that is why it has to be a multilingual communication. And so my presentation, if at all, next time invite me only for that presentation, and it's called Learning Through Trust on Book, Lens and Drum. Then I'll come with a film and talk about it. Thank you. Thank you.